Good evening, everyone. Time for another silver update. Now, this is a really important article on Zero Hedge, so I'm going to spend a lot of time on this article about Bernanke's blog. And that's really telling that Bernanke's coming out and doing a blog. Um, but before we do that and get to this, I, I want to look at this chart here. I noticed the last time we were talking about palladium and the drop that it had. So I wanted to pull up palladium. I wanted to pull up platinum. Now, if you remember, we talked about how it's my opinion that, that gold and silver are monetary metals. Um, and it's not useful to look at their prices and, and think of them as industrial metals. Uh, they don't do that much with gold, but they do it all the time with silver. And, and I think I proved that it's not the case with either one. Now, these two are more so, much more so. Um, there's some really anomalous things on this chart. And you have to know the history. It's a long history. I've covered it before. I'm not going to cover it here. Um, you can see, though, uh, this is uh, palladium crossed over platinum uh, provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. But uh, so the, the candlesticks are... Uh, the palladium prices and the line chart is the platinum prices. Now, just to cover the anomalous events really briefly, um, it had to do with Ford Motor Company and the primary use of platinum and palladium is the catalytic converter and, and how that's used to um, deal with uh, emissions and things like that. And, and there was a futures and a Russian deal and a big thing that happened back in 2000 that caused uh, palladium to have that massive spike you can see and uh, then to have um, platinum then turn around and, and switch places with it. They're basically uh, used for the same thing. It, it has the ability to absorb unbelievable amounts of carbon monoxide and so, but they're basically in the same family of metals. They're very, very close. They do the same things. And so because one of the, motor, I think it was Ford, don't quote me on that, but one of the motor companies did a huge hedge with Russia and it caused a gigantic spike in, in uh, palladium. And uh, then platinum ended up coming into the game and replacing it. And then they switched places and now you can see it's going back and forth. So that's what accounts for these really weird uh, changes in the prices. But what this chart shows you, what I've drawn out here, is uh, first three primary trend lines. I'm going to be looking at these as industrial metals and uh, trying to show where the downturn is coming. And what I did here is I drew these, you can see these three arrows here, this arrow, this arrow, and this arrow. These arrows mark a point, and I drew a line. Uh, it's pointing to a line, the line that goes straight up here. You can see the arrow top here, here, and here. Those three lines that go up are the points where both of the metals turn down. So you can see that in about roughly, it looks like about April, no, it looks like uh, May, May or June of 2001 both of those metals turned down and that that was the beginning of that recession now you can also see here that uh, this arrow is pointing to this time frame here and that's roughly about uh, july of 2008 give or take and that's when both of these metals started collapsing uh, in some cases one started first and the other followed now you can see where we are at the current time this arrow is pointing to the event that occurred when both of these started down at the same time, and that's right there. So you can see um, the, the trend lines here. There's three trend lines. They're not perfect. They're parallel because I drew them that way, but they give you the general impression. You can see the breakdown on this, this one trend line that I've drawn here. We don't have a double breakdown, and that's usually going to be a confirmation of something that's going to be a gigantic economic crisis. And that's what I wanted to point out is that there is going to come, as Jimmy Rogers points out, you know, recessions happen roughly every seven to 10 years, sometimes three to four years. 
and we're already due for the next recession. In fact, we're past due. If you want to do the count here, um, I don't know what these square boxes are, probably three month periods. But if you do the count here, I think this one's 24. We're already at about 27. That's what these arrow lines to indicate the size. So we're actually overdue for the next recession. And that's pretty scary because we're getting some economic indicators indicating that we're overdue for a recession and, and that things are turning down. We can see here from platinum and palladium, both industrial metals, really, because I don't know too many people that buy them for investment purposes. And by the way, um, they could be a pretty good investment here. Um, we're talking about platinum at 1121, palladium all the way down to 550. And that's a big change. You can see that it hit as high as 950, I think here. So what does this all mean? Well, I think it's connected. Let's go over to the article I was talking about. This is Bernanke doing a blog and I'm gonna go through here and comment. Uh, it's pretty strange that Bernanke would come out and do a blog. And you need to think about the fact that we're still at 0% interest rates. And it's really strange to hear. We've heard since 2009 kind of mixed messages coming out of the government, coming from the Fed, coming from economists about the recovery. And if you've been around as long as I have, um, this wasn't the case in the past. You didn't have people talking about the recovery for seven or eight years and and then still have interest rates at zero. So this is uncharted territory. And if we're really about to turn down again, then we're, we're, we're in totally uncharted territory. But let's dig into this uh, breakdown of the Bernanke blog and I'm gonna comment. It would appear that $250,000 an hour speaking opportunities for Ben Bernanke have ground to a halt and as such, the former chair Satan has decided to dispense his wisdom for free to anyone who cares by becoming a blogger at Brookings. And not surprisingly, in his first post, the person who less than a decade ago said the following in exactly these words, quote, well, I guess I don't buy your premise. It's a pretty unlikely possibility. We've never had a decline in house prices on a nationwide basis. So what I think what is more likely is that house prices will slow, maybe stabilize, might slow consumption spending a bit. I don't think it's gonna drive the economy too far from its full employment path though, end quote. Is out and about defending the Fed and central banks from pushing rates so low in Europe, you are now paid to borrow money and are charged to save. So to those who are too lazy to click on the following link to the Brookings blog, where Bernanke is now blogger emeritus, here's the punchline. In what can only be described as a litany of defensive insecurity, Bernanke launches a full-on assault on all those who accuse the Fed of crushing the economy, which now includes not only tinfoil fringe blogs of the Austrian economics persuasion, but such very serious people as Guggenheim CIO Scott Minard, who over the weekend said, quote, the long-term consequences of global QE are likely to permanently impair living standards for generations to come while creating a false illusion of, of reviving prosperity. That's a good one there. A false illusion of reviving prosperity. That's what they're doing. They're lying. And rhetorically asks, why are interest rates so low? Let me pause there. Why are interest rates so low? Really, are we still in the recovery? Can anyone answer that question? It's almost like we're in in wonderland because they talk about the recovery. They talk about raising rates. They don't use the word tapering anymore. That's gone to the memory hole. It's crazy. We have zero interest rates. Will they remain low? What are the implications for the economy of low interest rates. His response to this rhetorical question is the following. If you ask the person in the street, why are interest rates so low? 
he or she would likely answer that the Fed is keeping them low. That's true only in a very narrow sense. Really? Does he really believe that? If you ask the man in the street, why are interest rates so low? They would answer that the Fed is keeping them low? No. They would say, what's an interest rate? Or something like that. Actually, actually, they probably say, um, they're not low. My credit card charges me 29%. <laughs> actually, it's true in every sense. What is Bernanke's loophole? He introduces the concept of the equilibrium real interest rates. In Bernanke's own words, except in the short run, real interest rates are determined by a wide range of economic factors, including prospects for economic growth, not by the Fed. To understand why this is so, it helps to introduce the concept of the equilibrium real interest rate, sometimes called the Wixellian interest rate after the late 19th century and early 20th century Swedish economist Newt Wicksell. The equilibrium interest rate is the real interest rate consistent with full employment of labor, which they're lying about, and capital resources. What does that mean? Perhaps after some period of adjustment, many factors affect the equilibrium rate, which can and does change over time. In a rapidly growing dynamic economy, we would expect the equilibrium interest rate to be high, all else equal, reflecting the high prospective return on capital investments. In a slowly growing or recessionary economy, the equilibrium real rate is likely to be low. Okay, so if the rate is zero, then what kind of economy are you in? Since investment opportunities are limited and relatively unprofitable, government spending and taxation policies also affect the equilibrium real rate. Large deficits will tend to increase the equilibrium real rate, again, all else equal, because government borrowing diverts savings away from private investment. Okay, well, if that's true, then, if that's true, Bernanke, then why has the Fed enabled the government borrowing? By If the Fed raised rates, then the government would have to pay more and they'd have to put their house in order and stop borrowing so much money. So the Fed is enabling that. That's ridiculous to blame them when that's what the Fed is enabling. He's absolutely right. What he just fails to notice is that the entire world is gripped in ZERP and increasingly NERP, which is that the current bubble implosion aftermath now seven years after Lehman, seven years, think back on that chart I showed you, seven years after Lehman is merely the third consecutive bubble burst in the past 15 years. In other words, the Fed may spout whatever mumbo jumbo it wants about why its response to the crisis was required. What it has zero defense against is why it's only policy under green the Greenspan Great Moderation Paradigm has been to inflate bubbles and replace a post-bubble vacuum with another bubble. And that brings you to the question of what's the next bubble? Could it be gold and silver? It, it might be. Ultimately leading to a complete and global economic halt and a world in which central banks now have to monetize all net developed world issuance. In essence, there is no Weimar state anymore. The entire world has become Weimar. And the only reason why no currency is hyperinflating in isolation is because absolutely everyone is doing the same cardinal, cardinal monetary sin at the same time. And that's really important. Okay, so you have the central banks of the world all devaluing their currencies at the same time. And what are their currencies measured against? Well, their currencies are measured, they're in a basket. They're measured against each other. So uh, if all of the central banks are devaluing all of their currencies at the same time, then how are you possibly going to know whether they're worth less? Well, you should know by the prices of gold and silver. But of course, we know that gold and silver are manipulated. We know that they're the canaries in the coal mine, and that's why central bankers and governments are intent upon keeping those prices suppressed so that they don't reveal what's going on. Continuing, of course, none of this will get much exposure. What will, however, is the former chairman's surprisingly defensive pivot in which it is almost as if he senses what's to come over the horizon when he unexpectedly said, what's to come over the horizon? Let me tell you what's coming over the horizon. 
pitchforks. That's what's coming over the horizon. When he unexpectedly says it wasn't his fault the entire nation's senior population was decimated due to his and Greenspan's ludicrous policies. Quote, when I was chairman, more than one legislator accused me and my colleague on the Fed policy setting Federal Open Market Committee of throwing seniors under the bus. And of course, this is financial repression. And that's exactly what they're doing. To use the words of one senator, by keeping interest rates low, the legislators were concerned about retirees living off their savings and able to obtain only a very low rates of return on those savings. And the punchline, I was concerned about those seniors as well. Yeah, sure you were. Perhaps he's referring to the seniors such as the Omaha octogenarians who had tens of billions in investments in financial system that would have gotten insolvent overnight if he hadn't bailed it out. And that's Warren Buffett. And, uh, you know, uh, forgive me for saying this, but that is a disgusting human being. Uh, That man who's trotted out every day on the financial news. I I mean, um, he really makes me sick. I think the only person who really makes me sicker is Elon Musk and all of his fake companies that use government money that would be bankrupt. That's a whole nother topic for a whole nother time. But uh, obviously, this is Buffett they're referring to. So I'm going to skip some of this because I can't do the whole thing. We're just going to go down to the conclusion here. And so basically what's happening here is that Bernanke is blaming Congress. And uh, we know that Congress is going to blame Bernanke. It's just a big finger-pointing session. And we'll end with this quote here. Yet the funniest part of Bernanke's diatribe is when he tacitly shifts away from the Fed as the culprit for all that is wrong and implicitly blames the government. Quote, a similarly confused criticism often heard is that the Fed is somehow distorting financial markets and investment decisions by keeping interest rates artificially low. Contrary to what sometimes seems to be alleged, the Fed cannot somehow withdraw and leave interest rates to determine, be determined by the markets. Oh, they can. The Fed can do that. The Fed's actions determine the money supply and thus short-term interest rates. It has no choice but to set the short-term rate interest rate somewhere. So where should that be? I don't know. Where should it be, Ben? Zero? The best strategy for the Fed I can think of is to set rates at a level consistent with the healthy operation of the economy over the medium term. That is, at today, low equilibrium rate. Okay, well, it's zero. So what does that tell you about the health of the economy? There's absolutely nothing artificial about that. Of course, it's legitimate to argue about where the equilibrium 